Bill's uh, started about 40 years ago as the British Institute of Learning Disabilities and now uh, we're just called BUILD, uh, keep the name a bit shorter. Um, but the focus was really about how to get better support in the community for people with learning disabilities uh, and or autism. And that's still a significant part of our work now is looking at how do we get better support in the community and prevent people living in more institutionalised models of care. So our focus really is on trying to improve the quality of life of people with learning disabilities or autism and particularly focused on those people who, whose needs haven't been met and maybe their needs have escalated as a result and they've become distressed and um, end up being supported in ways which aren't particularly helpful to them. So they're in the wrong environment or they're supported by the wrong people. So quite often people talk about people who might have challenging behaviour we're sometimes a little bit cautious about that term because actually it's not always the behaviour of the individual. Their behaviour happens for a reason and it's a result of us within society or us as professionals not meeting people's needs effectively. Hi, thank you. I'm, so I'm Sarah Leach and I'm the Director of Development of BUILD. Um, so my main role, I suppose, is to... Um, help organisations and services work better to make better services for people that need their services. Um, so we would probably do that by um, giving them resources, mm -hmm. helping them understand how research translates actually into practice. Mm -hmm. And we might do that really practically by providing training to the staff or providing consultancy or helping them to um, understand what the, pe what, what the people that they're actually supporting need and sometimes they haven't really understood that very well or if they have understood it they haven't understood how to make the service work for them so I suppose that's what I feel my role is and we, we have um, really about 30 amazing associate consultants and expert advisors who help us do that. So, And a lot of our focus really I suppose is about trying to facilitate cultural change yes. yeah. and it's cultural change within organisations, within service providers and the approach we tend to take to that is there's a workforce element, so it's developing the workforce and making sure the workforce have the skills they need to better support people, but also looking at the leaders within those organisations and those providers and trying to look about how we, how we get cultural change across the whole organisation, so upskilling the workforce but changing the organisation mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you very much. Um, could you briefly explain to us why the reduction of restrictions is a relevant issue in for build? Yes, what well, I mean, I, I think restrictive practices really are a failure to meet need, ultimately. Um, if we meet people's needs effectively, we shouldn't have to use restrictive practices. Mm -hmm. Now, I say that with a slight word of caution. There is time, say, where my ch children might run into the road and I will pull them out of the road to keep them safe. But it's probably still a failure of me, my, you know, me meeting the needs of my children that I haven't taught them enough about road safety and I need to go away and learn from that and think well actually I do need to teach them those skills so I think if we think about restraint as a you know a failure to meet needs and actually it's a learning opportunity and we need to look at how we can do things differently to prevent that happening in the future mm -hmm. so really I suppose the work of BUILD is trying to upskill the workforce is trying to change the culture and services is trying to better understand and meet people's needs to prevent crisis situations happening in the first place and the other side of the coin is we know, unfortunately, we get it wrong a lot of the time within services as professionals. And, you know, I've been involved in running services, definitely times I've got it wrong in the past. We need to look at how do we change you know, our practice and learn from our practice, learn from our mistakes. So we try and work in a way that's not critical blame approach. You know, this is sometimes really difficult. Sometimes we're supporting people who've got very complex needs. We're not going to get it right 100% of the time. People are going to make mistakes. But the important thing is we learn from those mistakes and look at how to do things differently. And I think the challenge is with restrictive practices that restrictive practices can become embedded and they can become part of the culture. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about restrictive practices, quite often, you know, we're talking about physical restraint, but we're also looking at environmental restraint and things like seclusion and segregation. There's chemical restraint and the use of medication. There's mechanical restraint that's still used sometimes. And quite often people talk about those four areas, but I think it's really important we think more broadly than that about restrictive practices as a whole, which includes blanket restrictions. So I was speaking to someone a couple of weeks ago who was, uh, you know, supporting within a mental health service. He was only allowed to go to the toilet on the hour. That was the only time. And if you were short staffed, people weren't there on the hour to take you to the toilet. So you're waiting two hours. So people would wet themselves and urinate themselves. 
I mean, it's just a highly ridiculous restrictive practices, but it becomes embedded, becomes cultural. And I think we just need to constantly question what, what are we doing? You know, is this really the best way to meet people's needs and treat people as human beings? So, so I don't know if you've got anything to... Um, no, I, I suppose I would say that it's so important for us because we think that um, everybody should have uh, equal access to a good life and opportunity and live, be able to live in their own community. So for those people that we're talking about that are considered to be, I suppose, challenging or difficult, quite often the way the response to them is to place more and more and more restrictions upon them. And that actually doesn't really help their situation. It probably makes them more frustrated and more challenging. Mm -hmm. So their lives become really, really narrow. And that's not what we would want for anyone that we cared about or supported. So I suppose that's the overwhelming thing is that we think everybody should be able to have a decent, reasonable, good life. Thank you. In, you've, you've answered more or less to the to the this next question, but the thing is that in Spain there is not a common idea about uh, what is uh, what are the restrictive practice and restrictive interventions. It's not not mm -hmm. so clear as, mm -hmm. as you have it. So I don't know if you want to add something from what you say mm -hmm. about the what is the idea when we talk about restrictive practice or inter interventions, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And how is it important to have the same uh, meaning for everyone? Yes, yeah. Well, I think that definition of restrictive practice, I mean, I th I, we're not always entirely clear in this country either. There's been a lot of work going on recently about better definitions and uh, that will help with better reporting, which will help with transparency and data-informed decision-making. But I think there are, you know, there are those clear categories of physical restraint where people are held on to, you know, there's the, the medicine or the overuse of medication. So we have a, there's a campaign uh, in England at the moment called STOMP, so Stop Over Medicating People, and that's what's particularly focused on people with learning disabilities and autism. Um, as we've been discussing at the conference, there's a significant uh, I suppose challenge in terms of why are we segregating and secluding people um, so often and I think quite a lot of the time the reason we're doing that is because we're putting people in living in services that they never should be in in the first place in environments that they can't cope with so therefore they have to be moved away from other people and I think particularly for people with learning disabilities and even more so maybe people with autism um, who've got particular sensory needs being in an environment with lots of other people who are distressed um, and you know on a ward that's a not very homely environment but there's bright lights everywhere it's not likely to meet their needs and then they end up you know from the feeling more distressed and that might result in certain behaviors and therefore people end up being segregated and leading these highly highly restricted lives but I, I do think it is really important we think sort of beyond those definitions to actually all sorts of restrictive practices so um, Restricted practice can include those sort of blanket restrictions that people have. So, you know, you can't go out after seven o'clock, or I think someone was talking earlier today about people go out for a drink, it's in the afternoon, not when other people go out for a drink. Um, so it's sort of very, very tokenistic. So how do we change those blanket restrictions that are actually what works for institutions and for staff? It's not what works for the individual. So how do we shift that approach? And really, you know, restrictive practices and institutionalized models of care they're sort of in a way they're, they're, they're so interlinked because institutionalized models of care in fact even on, on you know the mental health act we have uh, within this country is a restrictive practice um, so I think we need to constantly be questioning is this a restrictive practice is this necessary does this help meet needs of someone's needs is this improving their quality of life are we breaching their human rights um, so I think if we come at it from a human rights approach, kind of constantly questioning restrictive practice, we can help facilitate that cultural change that's necessary to better understand and meet people's needs. Do you want to say No, I was just going to say, if you hadn't mentioned human rights, I was going to say that's probably the thing we would... Okay, think. thank you. Uh, next question, we would like you to explain a little bit about the Restraints Reduction Network, what is what is it, how is it uh, working, and what role is playing in the reduction of restrictions in, in UK? Yes. So well, the Restraint Reduction Network, to be honest, is all we do is help facilitate it. The Restraint Reduction Network, effectively, is people who are passionate about human rights, passionate about restraint reduction, passionate about doing things better, coming together to look at how we can work together to improve practice. So we're really lucky that we've got, you know, a, a, a 
I suppose it would look good set of trustees, but we've got a really empowered steering group of about 60, 70 people now from across the UK. That steering group includes people from social care, people from health, people from education, but it also includes government bodies, professional bodies, academics, but most importantly is people with lived experience. And it's really trying to amplify the voice of people with lived experience about actually what their experience has been like. So really it's just bringing people together who want to collaborate, who want to make a difference, who want to change practice. Um, so our job is just facilitating that. I mean, I think that really the power of it is in, you know, the people working in a collaborative way as a sort of restraint reduction movement and really trying to lead a restraint reduction movement within the UK. But I think it is about people working together. And uh, and I suppose how we work is, is, is making sure it's not in a sort of critical blame culture, because some of this is really complex to get right. And it's it's very easy for us to blame individual practitioners or services or government departments or anybody else. But some of this is difficult. And I, I believe the way to facilitate change is actually teaching people what to do, yeah. not you know completely complaining or always being someone's fault. And I'll uh, say, why have you done this? It's actually, you know, what, how do we learn together um, to you know, go on a journey? So I think it is, to me, it is a very powerful you know, collaboration of people coming together who have a shared goal around re reducing restrictive practice. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I just to you know just to add, add to that, I think one of its um, the benefits of it is is that people are coming together and they've all got exactly the same aim as Ben has said, but they all might have found different ways to get to achieve that aim. So there is a lot of practice sharing and testing out of ideas, and it's a really good arena to do that in. So we have information going all ways, rather than people actually having to go somewhere to find some information or find someone themselves. They can come and join the community of practice, and there's already you know, people d trying to do the same thing everywhere else and they're immediately connected and there's a, there's a kind of sense of we're, we're doing this together, we're kind of, you know, almost holding hands with each other to, to move it forward. So that's what I feel. I feel it's very powerful. And I think over the last couple of days that has really come across. You can see people, oh, you know, I'm with people who, who feel the same, who want to do the right thing and we can help each other to do that. So I think there's a, a good connection for people, very strong, isn't it? Yeah, and then and you know, effectively, it is you know, it's a coalition of the willing. Yes. It's a collaborative that brings people together. But anyone can become a member yes. of the Restraint Reduction Network. Um, we have slightly changed how that works recently. So whether you're an individual who signs up or an organisation, but we are asking not just for a commitment to restraint reduction, but we actually want to know what are you going to do. So we are trying to facilitate a restraint reduction movement, but we are asking people to actually not just say, yes, I, I, I'm behind the idea, but what are you actually tangibly going to do as an individual, as an organisation? And I think if we can start getting, you know, dozens of people and then hundreds of people and thousands of people to sign up to that, I think we will see a change in practice because everyone will be doing their own little bit. Great. In Spain, for Plena Inclusion Build is like a big reference about how you are working with PBS and implementing PBS in the country and in different uh, organizations. I don't know if you can talk us about how PBS ha can help or is helping to reduce restrictive practice. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the two are sort of very closely linked. I mean, what, the Restraint Reduction Network really the focus is how do we reduce reliance on restrictive practices. Um, but for PBS, really, we're looking at how do we better understand and meet people's needs, ultimately. And I think PBS provides a very useful framework to help us do that and, and recognise behaviour happens for a reason. Very, you know, it's not that person has challenging behaviour. And I have huge concerns that sometimes that is the perception of people who don't really understand what happens. They see the person as the problem. Um, really, it's the polar opposite of that. What we need to do is get, why is that behaviour happening? We're the adults, the professionals, we're the services, we're society. How do we change what we do to better meet that person's needs? And sometimes that can be quite difficult because we don't understand what it is that we're doing wrong. But mm. PBS provides us with a framework to help understand that, to prevent that behaviour happening in the first place. So the ideal method of restraint reduction is that it's not how, how do we deal with the challenging behaviour differently. We prevent the challenging behaviour in the first place. So there's never going to be that need for restrictive practice. And I think PBS is the best evidence framework we have to achieve that. Um, so you're much more the expert than me. So well, I, think you've, I think you've explained that really well. I suppose I always think in simple terms, I like um, what David Bitoniak says. He says that if somebody is showing us 
what people might call challenging behaviour or difficult behaviour or distressed behaviour. They're actually giving us a message about the quality of their life, that the service that they're in or the environment that they're in isn't working for them. Mm -hmm. And I suppose then I think that PBS is very clear that that's our responsibility mm -hmm. to make that better for them. If we can make that better for them, they won't need to use that, so therefore we won't need to use a restrictive practice. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's the kind of, you know, it's the circle that's behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in a simple, we can use that in a simple, a, a very simple way, you know, or, or we can use the PBS kind of science of understanding to, to find out, well, maybe there might be more complicated things that might, might be. Um, so it gives us a very clear framework within which to do that, so we're not just guessing. Because mm -hmm. I think historically we've quite often guessed what's wrong with people and we haven't always made the right guess. Mm -hmm. So we've actually made things worse. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, get, getting the language right around this is, you know, it's a challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the term challenging behaviour, but I think if, if we use that term, we probably need to think about, you know, it, it's behaviour, you know, the challenging behaviour is communicating distress. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's communicating distress to us, which tells us we need to change what we're doing and we need to do something differently. Yes. Mm -hmm. And certainly my experience of when I've been working with, whether it's people with learning disabilities, autism, whether it's children, actually, you know, think about my own children. I mean, the vast majority of the time where something happens and there is, uh, you know, they become distressed. Nine times out of ten, I've, I've done something wrong and I've triggered it, to be honest. I'm not sort of beating myself up about it. I'm not going to get it perfect the whole time. But quite often we create the situations. We don't mean to do it. It's inadvertently. You're not, we're never going to get it perfect all the time. But I think we've got to have that culture that looks at what can we do differently. Where I have huge concerns is where we have a culture where it is the child or it is the person with learning disability or autism that is the problem because mm -hmm. they have challenging behavior mm -hmm. and it's almost a label that's on the back they mm -hmm. are a problem mm -hmm. and uh there's, there's a psychiatrist in, uh, in in england roger banks who talks a lot about uh, people have challenging reputations yes. as soon as you have a challenging reputation you're you're pretty doomed it's pretty bad news because it's pretty hard to shake off that mm -hmm. that label um, so I think we do need to be very clear. What we're talking about is, is people communicating distress mm -hmm. and we need to listen to them mm -hmm. and do things differently. Okay. Thank you very much. The last question, I promise. So I would like to ask you to give some advice about uh, for plena inclusion to organisations from Spain to the, for the implementation of a national strategy to reduce restriction from your experience, from your knowledge. What advice would you tell to us? I, well, I think there's two things, really. I think um, there's the six core strategies and the work that's come sort of from, from the US but been implemented in a range of other countries, including sort of Australia and New Zealand. So I think those six core strategies are really helpful. I don't think anyone would debate any of those things. Um, so, you know, I think having strong leadership is absolutely vital. I think having that sort of data and informed decision making is, again, absolutely vital. Um, you know, having that sort of more reflective practice and so that we're thinking about what we're doing, developing the workforce and making sure people have the skills they need, not just to, to sort of manage behaviours when things have gone wrong, but prevent that happening in the first place and making sure we put more emphasis on that than the, you know, than dealing with the problem when it happens. How do we prevent it? So the six core strategies, I think, is a really helpful framework. But I think to facilitate the change, we need to complement that with the human rights framework as well. So if we take a human rights framework, as well as an evidence framework, evidence-based framework, um, and I think the six core strategies is the best way of articulating that. You put the two of those together, and I think it provides a very powerful kind of uh, strategy to move things forward. I think the other thing is that there's a difficult, I think it is about cultural change, and therefore I don't think it's as simple as, say, a top-down policy from government, but equally it's not as simple as a bottom-up sort of movement from people. It's about how do we, you know, we want both of those things to happen together. So how do we get action at government level? How do we hear the voice of people with lived experience? How do we skill up the workforce? So we need all of those different things to happen together at the same time, I think, to maximise the impact. Mm -hmm. I, think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I suppose um, I would say, you know, the six core strategies are really good evidence base for it. it's worked in all other countries. So you could look to those other countries to, to see how they're doing and the kind of 
where they've done well and the barriers that they've met and stuff. But there's a, you don't need to, to invent it. You know, the, the kind of map's already there. But one of the things I do know that plain inclusion is really good at is listening to the voices of people with lived experience. So that, might, that would probably be the, a really good place to start. Um, maybe start thinking about how you could get some of those voices out heard a bit more. And you've been at the conference and you've seen what an impact that has even on people who know already, you know, when we're all sitting there thinking, actually, we need to do more. So I think, you you know, you've, you've got all the right things in place. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So I think, there's, you know, I think there's a lot of people who, you know, are very passionate about this agenda. And, but the people who are really going to facilitate change, I suppose, are not people like us. It's, it's people with lived experience. Yes. And the more we can get their voice out there, mm. the better, because mm. that is what's going to drive change. Mm-hmm.